Hi, Brian White is filling in for Buck Lavasser. Welcome to Discovering. What do you do when a bear becomes an unwanted guest? Tonight we'll follow the DNR through the process of relocating a nuisance bear. And we'll try to shed a little light on the current ammo shortage. Yeah, I don't think a gun store out there has ever experienced what's going on. But first, it's a trip to Ten Mile Creek Forge to learn a little bit about the art of blacksmithing. We're getting the fire going here and uh, I'm burning all the owl poles off of the, uh, the green coal I just put in there. And uh, once, once that, that gets burnt off and uh, the residue left is uh, pretty much coal. It'd be coal, could be almost pure carbon. And that's what we like to use for heating uh, the steel with. All that and more tonight on Upper Michigan's very own Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure, the only way I measure. Feelings that I have for this fine land, there is so much to discover. When you're a long time lover of northern Michigan Time long ago, the blacksmith was at the heart of every country village and was very often thought of as a magician because of his magistry of ironworking and ability to understand the metallurgy of the iron that he used. While it may be true that those days are long gone and items like knives and hammers may be produced in a more modernized fashion, the blacksmith still does exist. Off the beaten path about seven miles outside of the town of Bark River on a country road, You'll find a small shop cluttered with the tools of the blacksmith's trade, along with a multitude of artifacts that give testimony to how long it's been there. Inside, you'll find George Putman, the blacksmith. A lot of people got a lot of different ways how to start these fires, and uh, I still stick with the cedar. And I'll just take some of this stuff from the fire before, put on there, shake some of the little smaller stuff out of there. Actually, what I'm doing is uh, I'm getting the fire going here, and... Uh, I'm burning all the volatiles off of the, uh, the green coal I just put in there. And uh, once, once that, that gets burnt off and uh, the residue left is uh, pretty much coal. It'd be coal, it'd be almost pure carbon. And that's what we like to use for heating uh, the steel with. Uh, steel has a kind of a thirst for sulfur and uh, other unwanted. And uh, it, it'll actually penetrate the steel, especially on uh, carbon steels, which you don't want because uh, it can cause it to crack and stuff. Patty, do you have use for a, a little little hook to hang stuff from, a little heart? Oh, I'm sure I could. Okay, we'll make a little heart hook. Yeah. First thing I'm going to do is uh, heat it up and split it. What I did was draw out the one side there. Draw it out, now I'm gonna take and fold that all the way. Bring the other one and try to get it the same length as the other one. Well, when I was a kid, uh, my dad, Martin Woody, I went to an auction sale in Hermansville. And uh, Jerry LaPlante, he was the blacksmith for the IXL, the factory there. He worked out of his home behind his house, he had a shop. And uh, he made a lot of things like hatchets and uh, a lot of people around there have uh, some of the stuff that he made all the different sorts of things that he made. Very good blacksmith. And boy, I was really amazed at the place. I must have been about 11 years old, and I think. And I was just amazed at all the stuff he had there and how he did it. And I heard about blacksmiths before, you know, from my dad talking about blacksmiths and stuff. And then my grandpa, my great-grandpa Napoleon and Georgiana had a homestead in Eustis. He had a, a beautiful shop set up there too. My dad had really good recall, and he told me how he went about making a lot, of, you know, some of the stuff, how he remembered. And uh, that's when I got started. Yeah, 
Yeah, so I started when I was, when I was about 13 is when I, I made my first forge out of a five-gallon pan. Can't, I can't, it was a pail, five-gallon pail, and then filled it full of gravel. That was my bed in there. Big mistake. Once you start burning, getting heating up gravel, a lot of it'll explode, you know. So, <laughs> and I went, I started using sand. What I used for the blower at the time was uh, my mother's vacuum sweeper I took down. Off the exhaust, I uh, hooked up an old inner tube from a, from a bicycle, and I ran it into the two-inch pipe that ran into the into my duck's nest. What it was was a, a joy can. My parents used to get that tavern there, joy soap, and I punched a bunch of holes in it, the bottom of it, and then made a hole for the two-inch pipe to go in in the center of the, the five-gallon can. I used a pair of vice, vice grips to regulate the air going going to it, and uh, it worked out pretty good. Then I used a broken anvil, a broken rail from the from the railroad for an anvil. What we're actually doing here, we split the metal first, and um, after we split it, then we we um, moved one of the runs that we, we cut out of, there, out of the way so we could work on the one that was r remaining. We used what they call drawing out, so we drew, drew out that piece. And once we got it to the, the length we figured we should have, then we, uh, we made a record of it on the anvil with the magnet. And then I bent the other, bent that one all the way, and now we're working on the, the remaining one. And we're getting pretty close. Got to go a little more yet. Now what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to put them back together again, and then I'll work on uh, the hook end of it. The, the, the part that I'm working on, uh, the first part there, that's going to end up being the heart. Now what I'm going to do is round this off. You try rounding it as you're... As you're drawing, chances are the, the metal's turning all the time, and you don't notice it. And then when you're right about, when you figure you're about done with it, it'll twist off on you. When I take it out of there, the, the temperature is around uh, oh, 1800 degrees or so. When I take right there, that's about 1800 degrees or so, right there. You get to a real bright orange, you're nearing uh, 19 to 2000 degrees. And beyond that, it'll start sparking. Then you're burning the steel. Around 2,000, 1,900, 2,000 degrees, you're you're in pretty good, pretty good heat for a welding. Welding the steels together. You know, widen this out just a little bit. We'll punch a hole instead of drill a hole. You know, you, you can baptize it here. You grab a hold of it and then put it in the old moonshine cake there. Put it way down in there and swirl it around good. Yeah. When they, they started using iron uh, parts on ships around the Mediterranean Sea around the time of Christ, they had to come up with, uh, with something to put on the iron to keep it from rusting. So they came up with this concoction. It's one-third beeswax, one-third linseed oil, one-third... Uh, turpentine and they melted it all together and made a paste out of it. You put that on steel, you let it set for a week or so, then you take off the excess and uh, that piece of steel will, will stay for I don't know how long. You can find some of George's creations along with much much more at the 10 Mile Creek Forge gift shop right next door. We, George and I started the shop about 10 years ago and uh, we've been enjoying it every day since. If you're interested in unique gifts we definitely have them. It's kind of hard to explain all of what we have. I've, I've just diversified so much that it's pretty mind-boggling when you come in to try to really look and see everything that we have. I have a lot of original artwork here. My husband's and a lot of other people's too. Pottery, uh, glass, jewelry, mixed media. We have some perfumes. Some of them are from this country and some are from without the country. Uh, my husband does blacksmithing and knife making. 
A lot of the artwork that we have is by local artists, but some of it is from international artists. I have some photography from Ireland, some perfumes and things from Germany and soaps. I have uh, a gal that is living in Lansing now. Uh, she's a pretty well-known artist. Her name is Ingrid Blixt, and I have some of her things here. Very happy to have her work. Some little axes, they're put together like the marble arms. People used to make their axes, and those sell pretty well. Oh, some beautiful porcelain pottery. That gal lives up here during the summer. Elaine Brown is one of our artists too, and she does beautiful work. She does extremely intricate work, and uh, she's one of my favorite artists too. If you get the chance, stop in and visit Maureen at the 10 Mile Creek Gift Shop, or talk to George about a handmade knife or other custom piece of blacksmithing art. Don't miss the Wood Tick Music Festival in Hermansville, Michigan. Four days of great bluegrass, country, folk, blues, and rock and roll. Over 25 bands, fun for the entire family. Carry-ins welcome kids 12 and under free. Buy your tickets and campsites and find out everything you need to know online at woodtickfestival.com. That's woodtickfestival.com. The Wood Tick Music Festival in Hermansville, Michigan. There have been ammunition shortages before in the United States, but nothing like what gun owners have seen over the last six months. And I think I've heard just about every possible answer as to why. I paid a visit to Jay's Sports Supply and Powers and talked with Jeanette to find out more about the current ammo shortage. Unprecedented. Like nothing, none of us have ever seen. I don't think a, a dealer or a gun store out there has ever experienced what's going on. It's just a matter of frenzy. People are just buying anything and everything and the companies can't keep up with it. They're going 24-7. They are putting out as much as they can. It goes to the distributor, and from the distributor, it comes to us, and it doesn't even hit the shelf. Immediately gone, and the companies just can't keep up. Bottom line is just, it's all hype. I just read an article today, and it said uh, Hornady says they are blaming it all just on hype. People just buying, and rumor, rumor gets going, and... The government, from what we understand, they're not ordering anything more than what they normally order. People just hurry up, buy whatever they can because they think it's going to be taken away from them. Somebody walks in the door in normal times, oh, they're going to camp for the weekend, oh, I'll have a you know, box of 22 shells, take the kids, or now they just walk in the door, I want, you know, how many can I have? You multiply that throughout the whole United States, well, just in this area. I mean, it, it's crazy, let alone all across the whole country, and you take those people and start multiplying that. The bad thing is, it's the people who are running out and grabbing it all, or, you know, and getting it all, are making it hard for the people who are going to take a concealed weapons course, and they need, you know, a hundred rounds for the course. They can't even get it, you know. They, it's making it really difficult. People are trying to get into reloading, thinking that'll help, but that isn't helping because the ammo companies are taking primers because they need them, so that's not helping either. Powders at a shortage, uh, same thing. They can't keep up. We have large lists of people for ammo. 22 it was the longest, but that one we're finally catching up. Nine millimeters is coming in a lot better than it was. Um, we're almost caught up on our back orders, and I think by next week we probably will be. I don't think we'll have any back orders on nines if it keeps on like it is. 40s is still bad. Um, 38 specials are bad. 380s are bad yet. And we have people back ordered, but those don't have quite as bad of back orders as the 22 is the worst. And 22 Magnum. We're starting to get a few that are in the back orders there, but we don't have as many as the 22s. Shotgun shells aren't too bad, but a while, not too long ago it wasn't really great, but shotgun shelves has been pretty good. It's the promotional ammo, and that's what most people want. They want to be just plinking and, you know, and, and they want the stuff that's 16, 18, 20 for 50, you know, uh, or in 22s, they want to be back to the 250 or $2 for 50 or, and, and not $30 for 100 rounds, say. The stuff we're getting in now is not high dollar, so it's getting a lot better. That's the other thing, too. Our companies are not jacking up the price to us. We're paying the same price that we were paying before all of this happened. So when you see a price that's high price on something that normally before wasn't, it's more than likely somebody who's trying to make more money. 
you know, they're, they're the ones, the companies themselves, they're not, our distributors aren't jacking it up and the manufacturer is not. We're getting stuff in the same price we did in December. Yes, it's legitimately, there are some ammos that do cost more, but when you find the ammunition you were paying $20 a brick for and suddenly it's 100 then you know somebody's making money and it's not, you know, like I said, it's not coming from the manufacturer and it's not coming from our distributors at that price. Same thing with handguns, you know, well, and the ARs, the AR was the same thing. The, the ARs are back to normal. Some of the handguns are starting to come back to normal. It's got a ways to go. The ammo is by far not, but but the AR craze now. I mean, we get them in. We, I've actually refused a few ARs, which I never did that for months. Same thing with handguns, high-capacity magazines. That pipe went for a while, too. It has slowed down, and now people just want maybe a bargain one. You know, the seven, $800 ones. Or the ammo thing is going to come around, too. It's just give it time to settle down. You know, we, we got to get back to normal and let people get back in into the store and just buy what they need. And it's, it's going to be a while. It's going to take time. It's getting a hair better, but it's, it's still going to be a long way. It's time for the UP Outdoor Calendar. On Saturday, June 8th, it's the 25th Annual Richmond Township Community Club Kids Fishing Derby south of Palmer on M35. Registration begins at 7 a.m. and fishing is from 9 to 1. The event is completely free to kids 16 and under. A two-day ORV excursion hosted by the Sportsman's Off-Road Vehicle Association will be held on June 8th and 9th. The event is targeted toward youth ages 12 to 16. An ORV safety class will run from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. on Saturday at the Upper Peninsula State Fairgrounds. Also on Saturday at the fairgrounds, the Sportsman's Off-Road Vehicle Association will be offering a practical skills training track from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. On Sunday, June 9th, from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., a free 10-mile fun ride will take place from the Jack Pine ORV Snowmobile Trailhead in the Hiawatha National Forest to the Thunder Bowl Scramble area. If you've got something happening in your area you'd like to see on the outdoor calendar, let us know by visiting us at realoutdoorsup.com. Bears can lose up to half their body weight during their winter snooze. When the springtime alarm clock goes off, they wake up hungry. They'll feed on whatever they can find. And a five-minute meal at a bird feeder can provide enough calories to keep them going for five to six hours. Typically, taking down the bird feeder solves the problem. But in some cases, the bear's persistence can make them a nuisance. I followed the DNR through the process of relocating just such a bear. During uh, the month of uh, April, May, and June, that's usually our bear complaint season, uh, usually a bear comes out of hibernation and he's pretty hungry and most of a bear's diet is vegetative matter. So basically if a bear wanted to he could go out in a field and eat grass if he wanted to. But if a bear had a choice between going out and eating vegetative matter or something that's high energy like uh, bird seed, more times than not <laughs> a bear is going to go after the high energy food source. So in the springtime uh, the various DNR offices gets bear complaints and the vast majority of them revolves around a food source. Uh, most often it's a bird feeder, uh, tr um, trash, um, I mean garbage, or uh, a burning barrel. And the vast majority of bear complaints can be taken care of just if you just remove the food source. In certain cir circumstances, sometimes a bear causes additional problems, like uh, a bear getting in an apiary, for example, or a bear that's causing property damage. Those are the cases that we kind of look at and potentially try to, try to remove the bear. Our success rate is, it's 50-50. We usually are, we get a 50% chance of catching a bear when we set a trap. When we do catch a bear, uh, they have such a large territory size. A male bear can have a 50, 60 square mile territory that we have to move a bear quite a long ways. So a bear, if we caught here, for example, we'd be moving it as far away as we can. Uh, we'd be moving it 50, 60 miles. And uh, when we do, we usually try to move them in an area that, that's away from houses that are in a, a wooded area. And uh, usually when we, when we move a bear, we don't ever, we, we don't have issues with that bear again. If a big bear comes in, I just want to make it feel nice and sturdy, so we got to put something in here to make it. Hold on the... What we like to do is try to get him out, out of the trap as soon as we can. So the sooner you call us, um, the sooner we can get out here and get the bear out of the trap. There you go, hungry. <laughs> Today's recipe called for some donuts they, they with a splash of jelly. Layer it up tightly 
Top it all off with a dusting of Kool-Aid, and you've got a snack that no bear can resist. Well, the trap was set and the waiting game began. But lo and behold, on the very first night, the smell of donuts, jelly, and Kool-Aid were apparently more than the bear could resist. And he fell for it. Today we relocated a bear that had become a problem by getting into uh, bird feeders to start with and then when the bird feeders didn't satisfy him anymore he started going into a house at one point and uh, some beehives as well. So we ended up having to move him 50 miles from home, doesn't have any idea where food or cover is and had to endure a 16 hours plus in a steel trap. It's better for the bear than being killed, certainly, but this is already a stressful time of year for them. They're coming out of hibernation. Um, we do have green up finally, so they have some food, but um, part of the reason they become more of a problem this time of year is food is still scarce for them. So we're taking a bear from an area where it lived for a number of years, a couple of years anyway, and knows where the food sources are, to an area where it doesn't know where the food sources are this time of year. And in addition, we're most likely dropping it in the territory of another normally larger bear, which is going to run this bear out until it finds another uninhabited um, territory that it can claim for itself. So certainly not the best option for the bear um, rather versus someone um, to clean up the bird feeders and not having a problem to start with. Anything that the smells good to a bear, which is just about any food source, um, will attract the bears. So certainly if you have a problem with a bear in your area or you anticipate having bears in your area, clean up all those things, put them away. So if a bear does come through because it smells something that's in your garage or whatever, it can't get a reward for it. As soon as they eat something once, they're gonna be back to check on it again. So get those cleaned up and taken care of. At that point, if the bear's still hanging around, you're probably gonna have to call us to look at the situation again, see what else is going on. Um, certainly, if you have a problem with a bear and you've done all that, talk to your neighbors, make sure they've done the same because if the bear's in the neighborhood, because of bird seed at one house, it will check the next house as well. Well, that's it for this week. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week right here on Discovering.